in my recollection, women are banding together and taking on economic issues, using their market power in a way that they haven't in aggregate. There've always been, you know, protests and, and, and movements against certain companies or certain individuals simply because it wasn't necessarily in keeping with a woman's agenda, but now it actually is making a difference and it's getting people the numbers of women or the, even the threat that that many women could come together and use their buying power to affect change is something that companies are responding to. And I think Washington will respond to it as well. Welcome to Uprising. Each episode looks inside what it takes to lead the most dynamic and successful cultural movements. Some of them in the business world, some in the social realm, some in politics, and some in between, to see why people start uprisings, what gives those initiatives momentum and keeps them going, and most important, what lessons can you learn from these movements and how to apply them to your business and even personal life. Let's explore the secret to sparking movements that move people into action. Passionate ideas. Controversial ideas. Uprising ideas. The power is now in the hands of anyone. To start a cultural movement. Today's Uprising Pod is brought to you by WarbyParker.com. Get a free five-day home try-on at www.WarbyParkerTrial.com slash uprising. Five pairs, five days, 100% free. Pauline Brown is a professor at the Harvard Business School, and most recently, the North American chairman of LVMH, the world's leading luxury goods company. Pauline, it's a pleasure and an honor to have you back on the Uprising Pod. Any excuse to talk to you, Scott, I'm there. <laughs> well, today we have an interesting topic, and that is feminism. And where is it today? Where does it have to go in order to be relevant to all of those women and men who decided to vote for Donald Trump. <laughs> uh, so um, I think an interesting starting point is the idea that you know the resistance to Trumpism is associated with the rise of the new feminist movement. I mean, the Women's March in Washington was the start of this whole you know resistance to the new mm-hmm. government. So with that in mind, what is the modern feminist movement today? Um, Well, so I guess I would start off by saying, you know, it it may be a false equivalence to say that the rise of one thing is somehow correlated to the outcome of another thing. In this case, the rise of a new form of feminism uh, um, in conjunction with the election of Trump. Um, I think that there's a confluence of events and movements that are happening that some of which are connected and some of which are not. The march in Washington was an interesting case. I don't think it was something that was sort of spawned out of the election. I think it's the culmination of years of a sort of repressed voice among women across all of all socioeconomic segments, across race, and frankly, across family boundaries, where it really wasn't a women's march. It was a march in... Um, in support of women. And there were, uh, and I don't know what the actual breakdown were, were, but I know that there was a lot of men that was unexpected turnout among men in support of women. I think that's an important shift from past women's, uh, sort of women-centric activities. And the other point I'll make, and it goes back to the uh, first argument I was, I was uh, suggesting, that the outcome of the election wasn't necessarily a statement on feminism or a statement against feminism, You know, I look at the outcome of that election as not so much the voting for Trump, but I think it was the voting against Hillary. And I don't look at the voting against Hillary as one that was a voting against women or a woman. I think it was really a voting against Hillary. And it's sad to me that, you know, with her downfall has come questions about an entire segment of the population in the current political structure. I don't think that is the case. Could you... um argue, though, that the Trump election maybe reignited a new form of feminism? I think there's a new form of feminism that's emerging 
uh, notwithstanding the election. I see it in other forms. For example, for the first time, you know, in my recollection, women are banding together and taking on economic issues, using their market power in a way that they haven't in aggregate. There have always been, you know, protests and, and, and movements against certain companies or certain individuals simply because it wasn't necessarily in keeping with a woman's agenda. But now it actually is making a difference and it's getting people the numbers of women or the, even the threat that that many women could come together and use their buying power to affect change is something that companies are responding to. And I think Washington will respond to it as well. What do you think about the role of women in power? I mean, in, is it better today or worse? You know, there are no women involved in the U.S. government's attempt to rewrite health care. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, we have Angela Merkel, mm-hmm. you know, in Germany, we have women involved in a lot of movements, like there are three women that founded the Black Lives Matter movement. We have mm-hmm. Theresa May leading the UK out of Europe <laughs> movement. You know, mm-hmm. Marie Le Pen in France and her cousin who wants to upset her and take away the the party of the National Front. So their women are obviously in, in power, but do you mm-hmm. think that it's better today or worse today um, than it was in the past? Oh, globally, I think it's 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 better than it's ever been, um, and you know, measurably better than say you know a, a half generation ago. I think the U.S. has not progressed nearly to the extent of some of these other advanced markets around the world, and it has remarkably enough not advanced in a way that I've seen in places like India, you know, in, in not so advanced markets. I think the U.S. is 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 more stuck in a tradition in a in a thought process that's not been as favorable for women. You know, and some of that is, and I think this is playing out in a lot of ways, but the U.S. is right now a victim of its own success. It's a young country, right? And over the course of barely two centuries, it became by far the biggest world power. And it did so really initially on the back of slavery, right, which allowed us to uh, expand into new territories and be very productive agriculturally and otherwise. And then the Industrial Revolution which was built on automation and it was built on a very sort of top-down way of, of, of setting up companies and other institutions. And now the world is moving past those particular power structures, but there's reluctance in America because it did so well under them. And I think it it explains some of the, the, the race issues that we, we still have not overtly, but still covertly. And it's definitely uh, explaining why, for example, the workforce hasn't evolved uh, in providing things like childcare, or even considering that, in a way that you know women and their rights have evolved. So there's what we say, and then there's the behaviors that are still very entrenched in an old world way of of operating. Yeah. And in the case of the U.S., old world is really 40s, 50s, 60s. We're not operating in a 2017 mindset when it comes to especially institutional governance. You definitely see that in other parts of the world. I mean, obviously the mar- countries like. Canada and Sweden are a lot smaller than the United States, but, you know, the government in those countries have made laws that have forced upon society systems and structures that allow women to be both mothers and leaders of companies Mm -hmm. or leaders of government. In -hmm. fact, I think in Sweden today they have a law that 50% of the government have to be women, Mm -hmm. which makes sense since they're representing women and they make Mm -hmm. up 50% of the population. You obviously work with a lot of young people in your role as a professor at Harvard. What what message did the Groper in Chief becoming president send to your women students? <laughs> um, so I, I happen to teach a very pragmatic group. Uh, I would say that you know when I give talks to undergrads and especially undergrads in the humanities and and other liberal arts settings. I think that there's much more debate and reflection on what does that mean for our society and what does it mean for me as a woman. The group that I am teaching, first of all, they're Harvard Business School, so they're there to study business leadership. They're already a very confident group of women, or they wouldn't have gotten to that point, given all the the screens that they've gone through to get there. And so I don't think that they're representative of what I would find in 20-somethings across the board. That said, I think that there are other things that are on their mind, having less to do with what Trump represents or uh, anything, frankly, that the political leadership might represent. I think what really plagues them is how they will continue to excel and lead and you know, keep up with their male classmates 
while having things that are so specific to women, like children. So I think that plagues them. And I don't think we're any closer to a solution now uh, than we were, frankly, when I graduated from business school 25 years ago. Hmm, that's interesting. How, so do you feel that um, that issue is something that they're leaning into more? And are they becoming more I don't know, activists to change those structures so that there are more systems? I mean, do they want to have power in their careers, but also in their lives to be able to, you know, as you say, yeah. deal with the motherhood issue, parental issue, but also be an um, engaging member of, a, of an organization, the government or, or a company? Well, I think one of the ways that they've expressed a reconciliation is that there's a lot more of a tie or a draw to entrepreneurialism. When I graduated from business school, you know, I can't remember any of my female classmates who contemplated starting their own business, not just right out of school, but even in the next several years after business school. And given the choice, if they knew that they could get the funding, if they knew they had a good idea that was well encouraged, most of them coming out of business school right now would want to dive in and start their own business. And I don't think that's just because they look at the likes of a Mark Zuckerberg and say, wow, I could become a billionaire by the time I'm 30. I don't think it's just about that. I think it's also about the freedom that that represents. I think it's the ability to affect change in an environment you can control. And the reality is, even at the senior most levels, any man or woman really cannot control or cannot have that much change in any short time frame over these very entrenched corporate structures. Hmm. Whereas if you start a company or you join a, an earlier stage company, you know, one voice can make a huge difference. Well, plus you make the rules too if you decide to You take. set the rules. Yeah. Right. And that's very appealing. Hmm. You can build your company around your lifestyle versus the other way around. Yeah. I mean, I think that the flaw in that thinking is, is that there are, there are other pressures that come with having your own business, not least of which is just the intensity to do everything because you don't have necessarily the funding or the cushion to be able to delegate and to sort of spread risk over many people over many months. And so oftentimes the intensity of that is going to preclude some of the balance that they think they'll be able to pursue. You know, it's, it's a different kind of pressure, certainly, than having a boss and having a sort of set of systems that you have to fit within. Well, you get, you're married to your spouse and you're married to your company, so it creates a That's bit true. of a jealousy. <laughs> That's true. And then if, you're, if your spouse is uh, part of the company, that's even worse. I've seen that a few times, too. I personally ex experienced oh. the working <laughs> with my own spouse. And uh -huh. I think if you have very clear delineation between roles and responsibilities and you kind of respect those and you stick to that, uh, you can actually work really well because yes. you, know, you have someone that you trust and can share something with. Uh, but you, you know, know... No business in the bedroom and no, no talk at the dinner table and you right. can keep those things um, away Right. I mean, you, you're, you're right. You, you have struck an unusual arrangement in that um, you each occupy very different places within the business as well. And uh, your, your level of involvement is different. So that allows a little bit more balanced family life. Right. If, if you were both going, yeah. you know, traveling, if, if Karen was traveling to the extent that you are, yeah. that would be problematic. That's true. I mean, uh, uh, yeah, we never see each other. We'd have to meet up at like Copenhagen Airport for a, <laughs> a, you know, a quickie or something. Uh, right. But, uh, <laughs> and, and ship the kids yeah. uh, there for, for another form of uh, exactly. quick interaction. <laughs> Absolutely. So in your, I mean, you talked about um, you graduating school and um, your life and things haven't changed that much. In your own life, though, um, has the way people see gender and the role of women changed at all um, in those 25 years and or even in the last, you know, three or four months when Trump became president? Do you see a change? Is it going um, backwards, forwards? So, well, so first of all, the people who are uncomfortable with Trump as president to, or, or who are, you know, I should say discomforted by it, are discomforted by, by it for so many reasons. Um, really, 
least of which is the fact that he's a man and he's a bit crude, right? I mean, the, the bigger issues are around just his approach to governance and his his policies and his right. you know standing. And so there's so many reasons to, you know, to point to and say this is not my president or the president that I wanted to to show my children, that I think that that particular set of issues, which you're, you're alluding to around his, you know, sort of misconducts in past and his sort of chauvinistic attitude, I, I, I think that kind of pales, you know, in a way that if you take in contrast, say, Bill Clinton, who, you know, was seen as a champion for progress, who prior to, you know, some of his inappropriate behaviors becoming public, was really quite adored by women. And that there, I think that his his actions became more of a betrayal. I think we expected more of him, and I think we we thought that the agenda was the the agenda of progress and of um, sort of women's empowerment was somewhat imperiled by seeing somebody, a married man, who sort of represented the worst in in in, in kind of you know inappropriate married male behavior. Um, so at least speaking for myself, that one hit me on a personal level much harder. Trump, you know. It, again, my personal reaction is there are so many th- issues that I that I have with his presidency and with his his whole uh, presentation that I almost assume his behavior toward women is what it is. Uh, and I, if anything, I feel sorry for you know his 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 wife and his past wives. Um, they're the ones I think that have to suffer through that. I expect no better. But do you see yourself having, I mean, in your own life and in the people you relate to or work with? Do you see them thinking differently about women than they did um, before Trump? Like, is it still think, possible, yeah. like, for women yeah. to have a role in the upper echelons of business the way they used to? So I think that the first question, which is one that, you know, I've asked myself over the years, is, is, is <laughs> so do you want it? Careful what you ask for. There's many different forms of power and there's many different forms of success. And I think it's we're much more liberal and open now as to what we can look to with a certain sense of admiration and no longer to me is the fact that someone has a big fancy title and all sorts of corporate perks, a sense of having arrived. You know, I think we, we understand the complexities and the trade-offs much more profoundly than, you know, we may have 10 or 20 years ago. And so that's point number one. And then there are new forms of success. So I think that the one that, that the archetypes that are getting the most adoration and visibility are those that are creating new businesses and new business models and new ways of thinking, those that are expressing creativity, those that are thought leaders. And and that typically, by the way, isn't someone sitting in the corporate ranks. So I guess point number one is, you know, if it's not what you want, then you don't really feel uh, necessarily dis- disappointed or discouraged that you don't get it. And then the really the real question is what it you know is is having more clarity on how to go for what you actually do want. I do think we're in an interesting juncture where, if anything, some of the shifts in female empowerment and and I do see women approaching the issues and their rights and their ambitions with a lot more uh, assertiveness now than they did in the past. Um, but I also think that it's affecting men and where they fall in this. And we really haven't had an equivalent men's movement to redefine what it means to be a man in an, in a society where women are are have have more choice than they've ever had, uh, have new you know forms of of expression, um, are uh, increasingly independent and independent not just financially, um, you know, uh, psychically as well. So so I think that that's one of the um, you know, one one of the the issues that I'm I'm still waiting to see how it plays out. You know, how how do young men and and frankly more establishment? I can see more establishment just show resistance. They want to cling to something. They want to make America great again, which basically makes America like it was for their fathers, who had all the sorts of opportunities that are not so plentiful for that next generation. I understand that there's that's where they're coming from. But the next generation that doesn't mean anything. Make America great again. They didn't know that America. So maybe, you know, are there still women issues or do we have human issues, you know, that we have to address? Uh Uh, I think certainly we have societal issues. So uh, what we're talking about right now is is a is an interplay. It's between sexes. It's between socioeconomic groups. It's between races. We have a lot of societal issues that, you know, we haven't sorted out properly and fairly separately. You know, I think there, there are humanistic issues 
which are less connected in my mind to sort of the women's movement and so forth and more around approaching our gains with a sense of what what's the impact of that on the larger population, what's the impact on the environment, what's the impact on animals mm, and, and their yeah. rights or their deservedness not to suffer. You know, there's a lot of yeah. like kind of suffering that happens at the I'd say at the expense of of progress we take so much pride in. Well, it seems like there was like a structure, you know, that was developed back in the uh, Fertile Crescent about how agrarian societies should function. And that includes human at the top apex and then women kind of somewhere beneath the male and then the beasts of burden and all other animals beneath that and Mother Earth kind of like beneath them. And Mm -hmm. it's that, that world order obviously is still here. And no one's really been able to challenge it fundamentally. Um, Yeah, yeah. And that's really the issue. How do we flip that pyramid around so that we start, you know, with the earth and the the animals? The the reality is the pyramid has shifted, but I often read consciously or unconsciously people who are fighting to make America great again are really fighting to restore that hierarchy that started with white males and then extended to white females and then to blacks, and then to animals, and then to the earth. And now all of a sudden, you know, we see how decayed the the earth is, and the fact that it's probably, you know, the the earth will outlast humans, for sure, but it will uh, will go through a lot of decay, then it'll have to rehabilitate. And many people who, I I think, are afraid of the, the, the changes we're talking about to sort of restore a certain sustainability, are really saying, in the process, that, that their traditional and rightful position is being challenged, that rightful position at the top of the pyramid. Which it should, you know. Which it should. Um, I, I mean, you and yeah. I think so, because we obviously uh, we're, we're progressives and we're, we're privileged, so we don't, we don't feel the suffering that comes if the EPA puts, you know, um, protection of birds ahead of some local employer who wants to, you know, uh, use the resources for to for, cook uh, birds. for its own, to, to cook birds, or, <laughs> or or is willing to kill birds in the process of doing its industrial work. Right, right, right. Yeah. So, so therein lies I, the, the the challenge for those people who are caught in the middle, yeah. and I, I feel for them. But it's also this is this is the laws of of Darwin. It's also the industries that are being caught in that in that survival a struggle. Well, the challenge. I mean, longer term, the challenge becomes if you accept the premise of that then as artificial intelligence sort of takes over from human intelligence, they could just follow that same philosophy. So there's humans there. They don't necessarily not, they don't necessarily mean to harm humans. They just humans happen to be in the way of them needing to produce paper clips. And by the way, humans are made of carbon, so let's just use humans. They don't think you know, <laughs> so it's, it's a similar <laughs> philosophy. But uh, but getting yeah. back to the hum- the feminist movement, I mean, do you think that, um, based on what you were saying earlier, do you think that the feminist movement is dead, or is or or maybe just irrelevant today? Um, well, I don't I don't think it's re- irrelevant. I think that one of the problems is language. So um, if I ask, I'll take my students, for example, who you know by all definition. They should proudly call themselves feminist. They are um, on a fast career track. Uh, whether they have kids or not is a choice. Um, if they are pregnant and don't want to have the child, that is also a choice, as the law stands. And they would fight hard if that were ever imperiled, most of them, no matter where they stand on the political spectrum. That's something they hold sacred. Um, you know, All the basic tenets of feminism would apply to them. And yet if I ask the class, you know, how many of you women out there are feminist, I think maybe 10 or 15 percent of them will raise their hand. It's not a label that they are comfortable with. And I don't know, by the way, that that my peers are so comfortable with it either. And I think that the sad part is, you know, and you're a branding expert, you know, that often people confuse the implications of the brand with the implications of of the movement. Um, right. So the movement to me is alive and well, um, but I don't know people even around that march in Washington who were quick to call it a feminist movement. So in the last few weeks, we've seen actually more than maybe the last few months, we've seen a number of women come out against the leaders of Fox News. What do you mm-hmm. make of this? I mean, this has obviously been going on for years, but yes. over the last 
six months, it just seems for the first time that like someone realized, well, hold on a sec, this is, I should come out and say something. Why haven't they come out earlier? What What's right. changed? Well, so some, I think the real change here, and the only reason that ultimately the whole um, system was sort of toppled down, starting with uh, Roger Ailes himself, is that the advertisers got spooked, right? I think um, if not for that, I think that they could have stuck to the old narrative and they probably could have discounted the accusations. Um, and, and then you say, well, why did the advertisers start to pull, right? Because you had about $100 million uh, alone just going toward um, the Bill O'Reilly show and Fox made the calculus. I don't think they made the calculus, he has to go because we want to lose $100 million this year because I don't know that that, that money was going to be reallocated to other programs. I think they made the calculus because they said, we're going to lose that money and we better get ahead of the issue. And it would have become intolerable for an advertiser. If you were the last man standing uh, advertising on Bill O'Reilly after the issues had come public and after the momentum was mounting, you know, then you're twice as bad, right? It's, it's one thing if you were always there advertising and supporting those statements. But right. now that we know, so I think that there was a bit of a sort of rats on a sinking ship mentality among the advertisers. Mm. And I think that that forced management to make a very pragmatic call. I wish, you know, in my dreams, in my, in my uh, idealistic dreams, that, and I think word had been out there for some time uh, about these behaviors and accusations and so forth. I wish management had said at that point, not even for business reasons, but just this is not okay. This is not okay for an organization. I think part of the problem with big companies, uh, many companies as well, not just big, but it, 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 I'd say it's, it, the stakes are higher with big companies, is that most of them are not really thinking about sustainability in an economic term. So they think about it, you know, if you use the word sustainability, it's often referred to around environmentalism, right? But what about just sustainability of the company? What about this idea that, you know, how many companies we... We know, and, and maybe highly successful today, could we say with great confidence, will be in that same tranche in 50 years from now. I mean, remarkably few. Right. Remark yeah. And that's not an issue of, of disruption and innovation. You know, there are a few companies like, you know, maybe Google, you know, you could say, well, what made Google great now wouldn't necessarily make it great in a different technological era. Yeah. But, I mean, content, we're not going to stop consuming content. It's interesting. So, it's interesting, though, that you have like I, I could sort of see how, let's say, um, old school companies or companies run by old school men get tangled in these issues, right, of of, um, of female abuse and so forth. What mm -hmm. I find fascinating is these new age companies. This issue still exists. So yes. you've read headlines in Uber. I mean, they have yes. similar problems as Fox News. Yeah, I mean, what's interesting about the Uber case. Is, so Uber hasn't been around that long, right? And it went from zero to 20 billion or whatever it is in very few years. Um, and it can go from 20 back to zero in just as fast, right? So the sure. movements um, and the speed of change, it can hit these companies both ways. And once the issue started to become public, and it didn't take that long, it isn't like Fox where this has probably been these sort of instances might have been going on for, for a decade or two or more, certainly as long as Roger Ailes was there. There are many more mechanisms for people to sort of share with the world what's going on, to protest. Um, and in the process, you had this counter movement of, you know, delete Uber, which was a hashtag. And by the way, it was affecting the company. Mm. Company is still very big and, uh, you know, publicly is, try is, is, is being well managed in terms of its PR campaign. Um, and it searched for, you know, a more grown-up COO to try to in instill more better behaviors and so forth. But I, I think what they're probably missing in that is that this is not an optics challenge. This is not about getting in, you know, their version of a Sheryl Sandberg and, and showing the world that, uh, you know, they can have a senior, more mature woman at the top to keep everyone else in check. This is really like, wh wh why are these kids even starting down that path. What happened in their home life? I mean, your sons and my son, he wouldn't act that way around other women. I, I can't envision, even if he was in a culture that might have encouraged it. You know, well, I just don't is, think... So. There is, yeah. I think, a, interestingly enough, I was speaking with um, Katie Hood, who runs a movement called One Love, which is a movement to stop relationship abuse and, more importantly, to establish values 
for positive relationships. And it was the result of a um, young woman who was killed by her lacrosse player boyfriend in mm -hmm. a fit of anger and rage. And we were just talking about how certain cultures in the United States um, just seem to be predisposed to this kind of behavior, like sports culture. Mm -hmm. And these, you know, these are, again, bigger issues that have to be, you know, dealt with. And she's doing a great job with her movement. Mm -hmm. But you do see it. It does yeah. exist. And yeah. people running companies see themselves in almost like sportsmen's like competition with yeah. other firms. So, you know, it's not unrealistic to see that behavior actually seep in. Right. I do think certain cultures breed it more than others. In the case of Uber, you not only have mostly guys, that's a Silicon Valley phenomena of young, sort of technical, educated, technical oriented guys, but they're young, right? And they are being charged with making, you know, huge decisions for ever expanding organizations and with large budgets and very aggressive investors behind them. And they just don't, they don't have the necessarily the emotional readiness to withstand that pressure properly. For you, the listeners of Scott Goodson's Uprising Pod, Warby Parker is offering a free five-day home try-on to give you the opportunity to check out their glasses. To get your home try-on today, go to warbyparkertrial.com slash uprising. Again, that's warbyparkertrial.com slash uprising for your free five-day home try-on. It's interesting. My first podcast was during the primaries. And I interviewed Franz Duval, who's the world's foremost primatologist at Emory. He's based at Emory University. Um, and I asked him to analyze the facial snarls of Donald Trump as the uh -huh. candidate <laughs> you know, in the GOP. And he did a really great job. You can actually listen to that podcast. It's really funny. Um, but one of the things he said was the first thing that a chimpanzee who is trying to challenge the alpha male does in order to gain respect in the community, is he beats the, up the female chimpanzees. So huh. physically, they actually beat the females up, uh, so they demonstrate their strength and virility within the group. And once they do that, then they're respected, then they're prepared to take on bigger and tougher uh, mm. individuals. I think dolphins also show a similar sort of fraternal behavior against women. I've heard that they actually will gang up and rape other female dolphins. And so often the female dolphins will have to travel in groups in order to create a cluster. And what was interesting with his um, observation was it was happening at a time when he was in this sort of wrestling match with uh, Megan Kelly from Fox News. Uh -huh. And there was a, you know, a little bit of that going on there. And I guess the question I have is, throughout that process and the election, and then, of course, Trump winning the presidency, what do you think the response is or what kind of response has Trump evoked among women that you know? Well, I don't know a representative sample of the population, right? I live in New York. I teach in another sort of a very elite uh, East Coast institution at Harvard. You know, my Facebook friends are by and large, probably out of almost a thousand, all but, you know, three who <laughs> would have voted the same way in the last election. So I don't know that I'm getting as full a picture. So when, when you ask me, you know, how do, how do my peers and how do I react to the fact that he's a president? Um, I mean, with a certain astonishment. But again, not, I mean, in, in his case, unlike, say, Bill Clinton, who I respected, you know, for so many reasons, except for his, his cheating on his wife and cheating with a young girl who could be his daughter and his sort of lewd behavior uh, over many decades, right, which you know, we all know now and had been whispered about at the time. Like that to me was something that was hard for me to get my arms around. With Trump, you know, I'm, I'm afraid about our security. I'm afraid about um, the kind of people he's surrounding himself with and their level of competency. So mm -hmm. the this quote unquote locker room stuff, which I think is worse than locker room, but I mean, I don't, yeah, I don't even have the mental energy to worry about that one vis-a-vis -vis the bigger issues, which are planetary in nature, hmm. and which will take a long time to recover from. I'm sure of that. One last question I have is, obviously, we want to see more women have seats of power on company boards, running companies, in government, 
I mean, I can't remember what it is now, the statistic, but it was something to the, like, 8% of the U.S. government are women or something like that. Maybe it's a little bit more, but that's significantly below, you know, uh -huh. representation of the population. Yes. Um, without women in seats of power, are we missing out on emotional intelligence in business, in government? Right. And how well, would yeah. this be useful? I mean, I'm convinced that without diversity, you know, if you look at any ecosystem, um, you know, the more homogenous it is, the more fragile it is, right? And it's very comforting if you're a certain type to be surrounded by other types who look and feel and speak just like you. So the human nature will always tend toward that kind of uh, harmonization. But the sustainability of an organization or a culture or a species really depends on diversity. And I think there's many ways to measure that diversity I think the fact that women are well represented is in a very important one, but it's really just one. I think if it would be a mistake for any company to just pick a very narrow type of woman as well, because I, you know, I've got to say in my case, as a white woman who was born and raised in New York, who, you know, has uh, uh, multiple degrees, um, you know, I have a worldview that will bring some diversity as a woman to a typical Fortune 500 board. But it won't bring nearly as much as someone who might have grown up in the deep south, a woman of color, a woman who, uh, whose parents you know, were not well-educated and therefore had to really overcome different sets of barriers. So I, I would look at diversity very broadly, but I, I think it's a, a, an extraordinary weakness um, you know, for, for all institutions not to do it and not to do it now. And, it, and, and I'm also convinced that Issues we've had, big breakdowns like the financial crisis of 08, 09, could have been um, averted if you had decision-making bodies at the board level, at the management level, that reflected, you know, these sort of diversity of value systems and, and thought processes and, and, and ways of processing problems and addressing problems that right now is not very well, not very broadly reflected. Well, you see that, actually, it's a great point in Iceland where you had um, I think the law is that 50% of the boards have to be represented by women. And I believe that um, in those banks that had a majority of women on the board, mm -hmm. um, they actually didn't have any of the financial crisis impact mm. that the other banks did in Iceland. Mm. It's interesting. Yeah. The risk tolerance is much lower than the men. And, and I think we have to be willing um, as well to give up some of the upside of taking big risks. You know, there's a time and a place to take good, big risks when you have, you know, an upstart working on a treatment for cancer and, you know, it, the incrementality of technological breakthrough is not going to get there, right? But for a lot of the risk-taking that we see, we've seen it in Wall Street, we've seen it in um, companies like Enron, right? It's greed. It's just about greed. Um, and it's really not about um, adding value or... Or, or, or cracking the code. It's about sort of competitive advantage. It's about self, uh, self-worth. And that needs to be checked. It absolutely must be checked because yeah. it's creating a lot of issues on the other side, including the economic inequities that we're seeing right now. I mean, a lot of that is just an outpost of, of extreme greed among people who have the power to reward themselves disproportionately. So, um, final question I have for you is, I mean, you, yes. one thing that I, uh, um, uh, amazed at is your ability to um, work with young women and inspire them and give them guidance. And I've seen a number of, of incredibly bright women who you've taken time to nurture. And what do you say to a new generation of women that want to step out into the world and try to make an impact? What's your advice? How do you yeah. guide them? I would say a couple of things. I mean, first of all, you know, often uh, success doesn't come through one or two big, you know, breakthrough moves or decisions or promotions. It comes through an accumulation of a lot of smaller areas of growth and advancement and um, a sort of deepening. And so I, you know, I think, I think in general, men and women of this next generation should be patient, should know that, um, that growing up doesn't necessarily follow a straight line, that it's almost more like a, a staircase, right? And you sometimes have a big jump up and, and a long plateau, and sometimes it's short and short, and, and to allow for those sort of um, more kind of bumpy trajectories so long as you're over time going in that right direction. 
I, in this case, I, I get a lot back from the kind of mentorship you're describing. I don't do it out of pure altruism. I, I genuinely like the women. I don't do it just because they're women. I do it because, you know, they're extraordinary people with a lot of promise. And, and it's inspiring for me to see them grow as it is to see my own children grow and, and prosper. Um, I do think, I, you know, that it, it doesn't take much to have a big impact on um, women in the way that you're describing for me to have that impact. It, it takes just giving them a bit of time here and there, uh, letting them all know that when there is a big decision that, of course, I'm here and you can call on me. Even just knowing that, even if many of them never do call on me, I think gives them an extra sense of confidence as they go through some of the struggles. So I would say, you know, this is all a journey. Um, I'm very encouraged by not just the quality of women I see sort of coming in, coming of age, but the the prospects for them to continue to. So I have a radio show on on Sirius XM, as you know, because you've been a guest. One of my last guests was my own mother, and uh, had a mm. very delightful conversation with her. And uh, we talked about you know her coming of age. You know she her her one of her first jobs um, working at a travel agency when she was married to my father. She was fired because she got pregnant, and they didn't think that it was appropriate for mm. pregnant women to be sitting in that reception area. No. And, um, you know, she didn't, she wasn't happy about it, but nor did it occur to her that there was any recourse. Right. And I sort of think right now that, you know, people get inappropriately fired all the time, but we have a voice and we have laws that weren't there in the past. So we've come a long way, certainly legally and culturally too, and culturally too, maybe not far enough. Um, but I'm very encouraged by by what I see and by how clear it is to us as to what good looks like. Well, Pauline Brown, uh, human thought leader, uh, <laughs> a <laughs> um, professor at the Harvard Business School, during the day and at night time, we, I suppose any time we can hear you on the Sirius satellite radio. Uh -huh. um, your views are always inspiring and uh, thank you. eye opening. So thank you for joining us today really great. Thank you. As good, to, good to talk to you, Scott. Yeah. All right. Have a lovely afternoon. Okay. Bye. Bye. Thank you for joining the Uprising Pod today. If you want to find out more about who was on or if you want to learn more about how to create your own movement, please go to scottgoodsonsuprising.com. You can also download this Uprising program from iTunes and where other leading podcasts are curated. The Uprising Pod is produced by Nicola Keneally with special help from Melanie Boardman, Karin Drakenberg, Philippa Freeman, Brianna Campbell, Farshad Faroudi, Mark Bruzzi, Mark Issam, James Politi, and Jonathan Weeks. My name is Scott Goodson, and you've been listening to The Uprising Pod, what we can learn about movements and uprisings that are shaping our world, in business, in society, and in between. For more on cultural movements and movement marketing, be sure to pick up a copy of the best-selling book, Uprising, How to Build a Brand and Change the World by Sparking Cultural Movements, available on Amazon.com. The music for the Uprising pod was created by Charles Duchateau. If you have a moment, please do give us a favorable review on iTunes so that our movement moves up the ranks of the iTunes podcast list. And if you have ideas for future shows, please let us know by going to scottgoodsonsuprising.com. Thank you, and speak to you soon.